You guys, thank you for being here. It's Sunday. Happy end of the week, beginning of the week, depending on how you believe calendars function. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dustin. I am a science communicator and museum consultant and a, an enormous dinosaur nerd, if that wasn't obviously obvious already. Uh, I'm currently in Ohio. This is an Airbnb um, that is not mine, but I'm here for a couple weeks because normally I live in New York City and obviously things are pretty crazy right there, in there, there, right there, in there, uh, in New York City. And so I thought I would take this opportunity to nerd out with all you fine people because we're sitting as a captive audience. What better thing to come together and talk about than dinosaurs? Uh, but guess what? I am not alone today. Cue the air horn. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, um, can we bring Christina to the front? There we go. Christina, hi, I have a co-host. You guys, this is Christina. I do a, lot, a bunch of science communication and museum tours in New York City with Christina. She is a geologist by trade. She graduated from the Richard Gilder Graduate School at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, Christina, what am, I, what am I forgetting about how your awesomeness in general? Oh, also, I have a very specific question. Is there like... If you had five minutes to show someone anything at the American Museum of Natural History in New York that wasn't a dinosaur fossil, yeah, hit us with it. Okay, I will. Um, I will share with you one of my favorite things at the American Museum of Natural History, which I know is uh, Bingo Square. Uh, I want to share with you my favorite rock, and I'm a geologist, so that's uh, that's a. a, a I'm multitasking here. Right. Uh, you, you figured out how to do screen share last night, so we're getting Yes, I know. Uh, it's, it's like choosing my favorite child. Um, so let me bring up for you my favorite child. It is uh, known as a banded iron formation, also known as a BIF, also known yep. as BIF, also known as a very old rock. Um, it's almost 2 billion years old. Wait, excuse me, how old? Two, at least two billion. And how old is the Earth, approximately? 4.6 billion. Okay, so about half is almost half as old as the Earth itself. Absolutely. Uh, and it's evidence of when life on Earth began. Uh, so here we go. Is everybody seeing my favorite rock? Whoa. That's really pretty. Well, thanks. I didn't make it. Planet Earth did. Um, how is that, by the way? Like, if you're standing next to it? Um, it's about six feet tall. Okay, so about as tall as a human, okay. Cool. Yeah, about as tall as a human person. Okay. Um, I did not include a scale bar, I'm very embarrassed. Um, so the red stripes you see in this come from oxygen in the water from little tiny plankton farts bonding with iron. Wait, so, wait, wait. Did, you, did you say plankton yeah. farts? Pretty much. Okay, plankton farts, go on. Just wanna make yeah. sure I said that correctly. Yeah, uh, bonding with iron in the water then trickling to the bottom. And then the rest of that oxygen went up into the atmosphere, helping life on Earth as we know it become possible, all the way to and including this Zoom meeting that we're having together today. So, talk about starting from the bottom. Now we're here. Wow. Yeah. So this is like the first evidence of, I guess, the the beginnings of the conditions that would support life itself on Earth, leading all the way to us right now in this Zoom room. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Cool. Just, that's the abbreviated history of two billion years of life on this planet. Yeah, pretty much. All right, let's, uh, can you unscreen share? Yeah. Cool. Good to meet you, everybody. Um, I'm also a middle school science teacher. So uh, I'm here to assist with science um, as well as address your questions in the chat. Good cool, to meet you. Cool. Everybody. Yeah, drop your questions in the chat, Christina. Um, will either help answer them or may unmute you so you can ask the whole group, depending on if the time is right uh, with respect to what we are talking about. Speaking of what we were talking about, you guys, this is day three of Dino 101. Day one was kind of a syllabus day. I got to know you guys a little bit. You got to know me a little bit. We talked about T-Rex and why T-Rex is America's dinosaur and not underrated whatsoever. Uh, we checked this guy out. This is a replica of a T-Rex tooth. Um, the one major takeaway, at least for me from that day that I think is the coolest, is that T-Rex teeth had serrations on two different edges, like double-sided steak knives. So if you look at a steak knife, you got those little grooves that make it sharp. Imagine those on both sides of this murder banana. That was day one. Day two, we talked about how you know what a dinosaur is, right? If we're gonna be talking about dinosaurs, we have to be able to identify a dinosaur when we see one. And so in order to do that and to help us do that, 
do that. Um, I made this chart right here. Can you guys all see this? My screen being shared with you? Cool, cool, cool. So there are basically two very simple questions to ask of any dinosaur or any animal ever. If you want to figure out if it is a dinosaur or not a dinosaur, if its legs are directly under its body and it's got scales and feathers, 99.8% of the time that is a dinosaur. It's a small exception, but that's how science works. Um, and so that's how you can tell. And you may notice that there are animals alive today with their legs under their body that have scales and they have feathers. Those are dinosaurs. We call them birds. Birds are literally living dinosaurs, special type of dinosaurs, similar to the way that we are a special type of primate, special type of ape. So you can use that flow chart, any animal you want to check out, figure out if it is a dinosaur or if it's not a dinosaur. Now today, oh wait, I should ask you because each day we, ask, we start with like a dino of the day. And so I actually don't know, and I'm sure, Christina, I'm sure you've told me this before, but I have a horrible memory and I've forgotten. Christina, what is your favorite dinosaur? My favorite dinosaur is the titanosaur. Titanosaur, the giant one, arguably the largest animal to ever walk on the face of the earth. Why do you, why do you like the titanosaur? I love the titanosaur because uh, it's gigantic. Yeah. It's uh, a plant eater. Mm -hmm. it got huge just on leaves um and the one at the museum is my favorite because i would always visit it in grad school there and feel my feelings and be like yes this is why i'm here dinosaurs are awesome so it's like my personal favorite individual oh, I dinosaur that. i love that titanosaur yeah it was found i think probably at this point maybe three or four four years ago in argentina uh, the technical scientific term is patagotitan named for patagonia where it was found yeah and it is, by all accounts, the largest uh, dinosaur that's ever walked on the face of the earth. There's a little bit of debate there, but I mean, it's literally the, the femur, just the leg bone, the bone that goes from the knee to the hip, is like eight feet tall, seven or eight feet tall. So it's bigger than a human. It's the single-handedly the largest bone we have ever found, ever. Uh, and if you're at the Field Museum in Chicago or the Museum of Natural History in New York, they both have model replicas, full size. I think it's like 121 feet long. The one Christina mentioned doesn't even fit in the room that it's in head comes out the, the doorway, it's great. So that- I saw someone asking for a picture and bringing one up. Yeah, if you can bring one up, cool, cool, cool. Again, that's why we have an amazing co-host. Oh, Yedna is here, what's up Yedna? Shout out to the uh, New York Hall of Science. All right, you guys, let's do this, let's jump in. Uh, what, oh, wait, oh crap, I forgot. What are we talking about today? What's today's topic? Christina, did I tell fossils. you? Oh, that's right, fossil. fossilization. fossilization. So we talked about how we know what a dinosaur is, right? how you identify a dinosaur, living or dead. Um, but the vast majority of them, outside of birds, are obviously extinct. So how do we know they existed at all? Like, what is the evidence that we have as scientists, as humans, to know that these giant creatures, well, some giants, some much smaller, actually walk the face of the earth? And it is through fossils, right? We have fossil evidence of these things existing. And so today, we are going to be talking about fossilization. How does the dinosaur turn into a fossil, right? And it really, it bears to mention that what we are talking about when we talk about fossilization, ultimately we're discussing, at least at the beginning, something called taphonomy. And taphonomy, and I'm gonna share my screen right here in a hot second, da 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 da, da. Here we go, sharing the screen. Mm -mm. <laughs> this is pretty gross, but here we go. Can you guys see that dead rotting thing? Yeah, happy Sunday morning. Um, so taphonomy is the study, and you can see how it's spelled up at the top there, T-A-P-H-O-N-O-M-Y. Uh, taphonomy is the study of what happens from, an, from the moment an organism dies until like we find it, whether this, this thing we're seeing on the screen or a dinosaur fossil many, many years later. Um, and it's interesting because like when I saw this picture, and by the way, uh, this is a royalty-free stock photo, um, if you'd like to support the dinosaur show, you can find me on Venmo or on Cash App. Um, no, uh, this, I like this image because it wasn't immediately obvious what this was, right? Can you guys, if you can guess what animal you think this, this corpse comes from or is, put that in the chat box. Because I wasn't sure at first. And then I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to use an image that I'm not sure what the animal is. But then I was like, that actually speaks to exactly what we are talking about, right? Even with an animal that is, still has some of its soft parts there, it hasn't totally rotted away, it's still hard to tell what it is. Now imagine instead of that, you only have a couple little pieces of bone that have been under the ground for millions of years. Talk about like a mystery, right? So paleontologists are absolutely detectives in a lot of ways. And this, do we have, Christina, do we have any guesses as far as to what this animal is? 
Um, a couple of people have said a lizard or an iguana. Lizard or an iguana. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Some type yeah. of iguana. Well, I guess an iguana is a type of lizard. Yeah. Um, so taphonomy, the study of what happens when an animal dies all the way up until we find it as, uh, well, hopefully a dinosaur. So usually what happens upon an animal's death is the first thing is either it's ripped apart and torn apart by scavengers. Uh, it can be eaten by opportunistic insects. The body parts after that starts happening can be broken apart and disarticulated. Pieces come apart, maybe even just by flowing water, right? But generally, when an animal dies, it's going to get eaten and ripped apart by other animals, large and small, up to insects, insects even bacterial decay. So it's very rare that an animal is very quickly after death actually buried underground or under sediment in a way that doesn't have all the pieces be ripped apart and taken different places. So it's incredibly rare to find a specimen, first of all, right? So the majority of the time, just like that iguana guy, uh, we end up not with much, right? But in some very rare and ideal preservation circumstances, very shortly after death, or even the, the, the sediment actually causes death, an animal might be covered in sediment, like right away, preserving as much of it as possible. And I want to show you guys uh, one of my favorite fossils that's an example of this. This is also at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. So this right here, you guys all see this really cool looking fossil? <sighs> Why can't I just do that? Christina, can we see this? Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. So this is, this is a dinosaur called Citipati, C-I-T-I-P-A-T-I. It's a type of oviraptorid. And so the name oviraptorid means like ova's egg, raptor is stealer or Caesar. And so this thing originally when we found it, well, we think it was killed, first of all, when a sand dune collapsed, covering this whole thing so that other animals can rip it apart. But we think it was killed while it was trying to steal, originally we thought it was killed when it was trying to steal or prey upon these eggs in the nest, right? You can see, it's almost as if the animal is sitting with its head at the top of the screen. And you can see the arms out to the side it would have had feathers. And you can imagine this thing was, well, we thought it was trying to steal or eat these eggs. We actually thought that the inside the eggs, let me stop sharing, because this was a Mongolia, we actually thought that the dinosaur inside those eggs were baby protoceratops. So this is a protoceratops that lived in Mongolia. It's got a cool little beak and a frill, a much smaller, not really spiked horn version cousin of Triceratops. We thought it was trying to eat those eggs, right? Let me go back to that screen again. But it wasn't until much later we realized that the inside of those eggs were actually that same species, right? And so it changed. We thought this thing was stealing the eggs, hence the name Oviraptor, egg thief. But really, this was a protective mother sitting on top of and brooding and warming, protecting her eggs at the moment of death, which totally changes like our view of this dinosaur from an egg thief to a protective mother. But I love it because A, it's a beautiful fossil, and B, it really speaks to the nature of like dinosaur science in general, right? Again, you can go look at a lion, see how it takes care of its, its young in the wild. You can't do that with a dinosaur. So we have to make our best guesses and we're always finding more information, improving what we know and moving forward. That is how the scientific endeavor works. We have a couple people in the waiting room I'm admitting now. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, so we had a question what? a little while back. Say it again. Uh, we had a question a little while back. I just sure. want to make sure that Sarah Ansi's question doesn't get forgotten. Hit me with um, it. She asked what the oldest dino is. Oldest dino. So dinosaurs, the first dinosaurs were about 230 million years ago. Um, it's, it's hard to know exactly what the oldest one is. In fact, we probably haven't found the oldest just because the fossil record is incomplete. One of my favorites that is very old, we talked about yesterday, Coelophysis. Coelophysis was the first dinosaur to show the basic theropod body plan, which are the three-toed, walking upright, primarily carnivorous dinos like T-Rex, like Velociraptor. Um, and even cooler in Coelophysis, some about 200 million years ago, first dinosaur with a furcula or a wishbone, which we now see in birds and which we see in T-Rex later on. So that was a really cool one. Pretty, pretty old. It's a great question. Oh, we also have another question uh, that Toninas, I hope I'm saying that right. I don't know if she's here or not. Uh, Toninas asks, do you think we'll ever find a skeleton before it adapted? Um, the thing is, everything is always constantly changing and adapting over time. So everything is technically before it adapted and after it adapted, 
right? Every population, every individual, well, not every individual, but every population is slowly changing genetically. Sometimes you can actually see it. Often it's not something you can actually visibly perceive. But every animal is simply in a process of trying to survive and reproduce. And over time, certain animals that are better at that have more offspring, and those ones have different features that allow them to survive. So over time, we see those changes. But nothing is like before it adapted, unless you're, you're looking at one animal that you know is the evolutionary ancestor to another one. You could kind of say like, this is before this one fully adapted, but no individual is before it adapted. It, it has adapted and here it is, it's living. It's a process. Um, cool, cool, cool. All right, so we talked about taphonomy. We talked about um, what usually happens when something dies versus a very rare and optimal preservation circumstances like this over -rap period. But how does it actually become a fossil, right? Because when you look at a fossil, when you look at a fossil, let's say like our friend right here, wait a minute, where'd it go? Give me one second, there we go. So when you look at bones like these, these are not actually bones. Right, we see some feather and skin impressions over here. We see some teeth, some claws, uh, some plates from a stegosaurus. These are not actually bones. And we'll come back to that in a second. But what I mean, well, I guess right now. So what I mean by that is there are two major types of fossilization, right? There is replacement and there is permineralization, right? So permineralization is when once in it, let's say an animal gets buried under sediment, over time, minerals in the earth and the groundwater seep into that organic material, into the bone. And even at like the cellular level, they replace the air and fluid filled openings and spaces in the bone, basically using the bone as a scaffolding to build uh, a model of it out of the material in the rock and the minerals uh, in the earth. And that again, that is uh, uh, replacement versus per mineralization, like permanent mineralization, per mineralization is when that same, um, the minerals in the earth and the groundwater around a fossil seep in and actually replace the organic material that is in the bone, building a copy, building an exact rock copy of that fossil. So when we find a fossil, it is not a bone. It hasn't been a bone for millions of years. It is absolutely rock that has taken the exact shape of that bone. So we can see exactly what it looks like. Um, so the organic material is no longer. Christina, I saw you put a hand up. Did you, as a geologist, did I say anything that was patently false just then? No, not at all. I was just waving goodbye to Emily. Oh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. You're here to fact check me too. <laughs> no, I got you. Okay. Um, but also, we have a question from Sarah Erickson um, referring to the processes of fossilization that you were talking about. She wants okay. to know which process is faster. Say that again. Which pro I'm not sure. I'm not sure which, pro which process is faster. Do you know? Um, so can you repeat the two you said? You said permineralization. Per mineralization, when the minerals in the earth seep into the bone and replace the organic material, like replace the actual bone, mm -hmm. versus um, replacement is when it seeps in and then within the, uh, wait, did I mess that up? No, Re within the uh, empty fluid and air filled spaces, it fills those in, it uses the bone as a scaffolding, basically. Uh, Permineralization will take longer because it's a really similar process, but just permineralization is replacing almost everything. Yo, rather I, than using an okay. existing sort of scaffold. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I, I just see a question from Piper, age seven. Hello, Piper. You want to know if fossils are heavy? Yo, great segue. Fossils are heavy because fossils are solid rock, right? So this is a replica. It's not very heavy. If this was a real T-Rex tooth, it'd be heavier. It wouldn't be this color. We'll come back to that in a second. It would all be brown. Um, and that being said, so if you go to a natural history museum, 99% of the time, if you see a fossil hanging from the ceiling, that is not the real thing. It is a replica. Because again, it's a, it's a rock. It hasn't been a bone for a long time. Rocks weigh a lot. They're not easy to hang from the ceiling. So usually if it's hanging from the ceiling, it's not the real thing. If it's in a glass case on the floor, it's much more likely to be the real thing. And also, just like as you might be able to see from this, which I will share right now, here we go. Um, Fossils come in different colors, right? They go from a very light tan, sometimes more of a reddish, all the way up to a deep chocolatey brown. And that is simply, the color is simply based on the colors and the composition of the minerals in the earth that surround those bones and then replace them, right? And that's, so that's why you don't see fossils that are like whitish, tannish, ivory bone color, 
like this right here. If this was a real fossil, it would be all much more in this brownish color. So that's a really great question. And in fact, that's also a good segue because you guys, all the images you see on your screen right now, the, the Archaeopteryx in the top left with the feather impressions, the teeth from the T-Rex in the top right, the toes down in the bottom right, and the claws and the Apatosaurus, on the bottom left, the plates and the Stegosaurus, these are all body fossils, right? And there are two types of fossils, generally two types of fossils. Body fossils, which just like everything you see on your screen, is an actual part of the body, right? So teeth, claws, skulls, that type of thing. And the second type of fossil is a trace fossil. And a trace fossil, I like to think of a trace fossil as like, it's not part of the animal's body, but it was evidence that a dinosaur was there. So trackways and footprints are a great example of trace fossils. Coprolites, we talked about that uh, briefly the other day. Coprolite is actually fossilized poop. When over time, again, it's not poop anymore, uh, but over time minerals have gone in there, preserved a lot of the minerals that are in the poop and you can actually see what that animal is eating. Like we found T-Rex coprolites with huge chunks of bone in them, knowing they were just swallowing chunks of bone whole. Right, but that's not actually part of the T-Rex. That's evidence it was there. That makes it a trace fossil. But my favorite type of trace fossil is this one right here. Do you guys see right in the middle, maybe on the rightish kind of side of this Triceratops leg, there's two circular gouges. You guys see those like puncture marks? Yeah. Any idea what dinosaur those might come from? Here, I'll give you a, a quick hint. <laughs> so those are T-Rex teeth puncture marks in this leg of a Triceratops, right? And the bone itself from a Triceratops is a body fossil, but those puncture marks, that's an example of a trace fossil, right? That's evidence of some sort of behavior. And so we know for this Triceratops, this maybe unlucky Triceratops, it was either killed by a T-Rex, because it would bit it like this, or the T-Rex found the body after it, was after it was dead and then started eating on that carcass, eating on, that's a new phrase eating on. Y'all, y'all, it's Sunday and we'll finish this up and we're going to get our eat on. Um, so those are, that's an example of a trace fossil. It's a really I cool. We have some really smart uh, viewers. They're yep. saying that it says T-Rex right there in the description. <laughs> well, listen, just because you guys know how to read and have great observation skills doesn't mean you need to rub it in my face. Yeah, no, that's good. Actually, I, I think I'm not positive. I think this picture is from the Royal Terrell Museum. Apparently, I'm not sure if anyone knows where this this uh, leg is from. I should have done more research because I've seen this in person. They have really good display. I think it's from the Royal Terrell Museum, uh, in, which is Canada's dinosaur museum. Uh, shout out to Sammy K. Sampson if she's watching. She works there. Uh, all right. So let's see. We talked about what happens when animals body after it dies. Uh, we talked about how it may get buried. We talked about how the minerals replace it, turning it into a, a fossil. We talked about heavy fossils don't hang from the ceilings. So you know, those are probably replicas. Talked about body fossils versus trace fossils. Christina, do you or anyone in the chat box have any other fossil related queries? Oh, wait, I want to show you guys one more thing as you were looking for those. Um, this, speaking of bite marks on Triceratops, we know that Triceratops and T-Rex lived at the same time. A, because we found fossils in the same rock level, in the same place, same age, same strata, and also evidence like those bite marks on the, the Triceratops leg. And in fact, I have not been yet. I don't know if any of you guys have gone yet, but the brand new dinosaur exhibit at the Smithsonian uh, Museum of Natural History in DC has a T-Rex preying upon a Triceratops. So let me share the, uh, the picture here. This is the model. Of, well, I mean, you can see what it looks like without the rest of the museum around it, but it's really cool because very few museums show two dinosaurs like this interacting, let alone one like literally feeding upon the other. So this is a really cool image of a, T-Rex taking a big bite or trying to take a big bite out of a Triceratops frill. Jada says, right, Jada, your whole first and last name were together, so I hope I'm saying it right, uh, mm -hmm. has been and it's amazing. Oh, and Steven is a docent there. Cool, cool, cool. Where? At the Smithsonian, right? Oh, Smithsonian. So Steven, you've seen this one. Okay, I'm going to unmute you, Steven. Yeah, Steven, if you want to give us a little, give us some deets. I need to see it. Okay, I'm coming for you, Steven. <laughs> also, wait, I'm just, while we're waiting for Steven, did anyone, do we hit bingo? Do we get a line across? Do we, does that, anyone? Grace, I know you're checking on this because Grace made the bingo sheet. 
I've been a docent there for a year now since they opened up last June. Nice. And and it's just a fascinating, wonderful museum. Um, you know, it's, it's lots of visitors coming in asking questions. They have, uh, you know, it, it's more than just dinosaurs. It goes from uh, earlier, earliest Cambrian times all the way up to the present. So Very the cool. actual dinosaurs between the end of the Permian and the end of the Cretaceous is only maybe 50 feet worth, but there's the Triceratops with the, uh, the T-Rex. There's, you know, lots of other things going on. Uh, it's just a great, great place. Nice. I'm glad it's back open. It was, you guys were shut, the dino halls were shut. Five years. Five years. Wow. But, I, it's, but it's all redone. Love it. Uh, I haven't been able to go yet. Hopefully when this. Come and, come and visit. I'm happy to take you around. Oh, yeah. All right. It's, I can't imagine going five have years have without you? dinosaurs. Sorry, Christina, go ahead. Sorry, Zoom is hard. Um, Stephen, while we have you, Keisha asked, what is a docent? So a lot of us are museum people. Can you, can you tell us what your museum people job well, is? Well, I'm, 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 I'm a volunteer. You know, I'm a, a orthopedic surgeon in real life, um, but I do this on the weekends. And we had uh, four months of, uh, of training where we had lectures uh, from the, the actual scientists who work uh, at the Smithsonian, uh, teaching us about uh, the, the history of um, paleontology and everything that goes on the, from the beginning of uh, uh, Antoya, the worms with the trace fossils, uh, all the way through um, uh, plant and uh, uh, you know, traces there, uh, all the way up to modern day. And so we learned about this. And then we also learned how to interact with patients with, sorry, with patients, I'm being my doctor self, um, to learn to interact with visitors so that uh, we can answer their questions and, and present more questions to them. Um, I'm probably not as well uh, versed in all that to uh, try to gain things out of the, uh, the visitors. Uh, I'm usually just imparting things, uh, but, uh, we have a good conversation back and forth. Uh, and sometimes I'll, uh, be asking about this and then I'll drag them over to another part of the, uh, exhibit, uh, sometimes even over to the ocean hall, uh, for the point that I'm trying to make about something or other. It's a lot of fun interacting with people. Thank you. Nice. Um, I should mention also, this is a really tough and kind of trying time for museum, museums yeah. in general and people that work and love museums. I know a lot of friends in museums have been literally been laid off um, because of the quarantine. Um, yeah. and so, Smithsonian is closed down. Yeah. I mean, not only are places closed down, but people are, are losing their jobs at this point in museums, which is incredibly sad. So I just want to say, first of all, shout out to all my fellow museum lovers out there. We're going to get through this together. And everyone else who is not actually employed in a museum, please, one of these places open back up. And even before that, try to support your local museum, your favorite museums online. Every single one that is worth its weight is doing different online initiatives, much like this, to keep people engaged and learning while the museum is shut down. When they reopen, go. Go and say hi. Go and nerd out. Share out your experience. Because um, it's not a mystery that I freaking love museums. They house thousands, if not millions, if not billions of years of art, history, science, and culture. And I don't know where I or society would be without them. Support your local museum. Okay, so we have just a few more minutes left. But what I want to do in these last couple minutes, um, I want to mention, first of all, that tomorrow we're going to talk about extinction. So we're going to do extinction tomorrow. Um, so if you have extinction-related questions, you can drop those in the comment box. I will use those tomorrow during our discussion. Um, I have a very good question. I was wondering which T-Rex would be more accurate according to scientists. This one that's more like this or stood up? I didn't really know at first. So I wanted to ask that question. I, I missed the, the visual. What, the sec say that, can you repeat that one more time, Rob? Um, I was wondering which T-Rex would be more scientifically uh. accurate. Uh, one that was stood up or one that would be more accurate to the movies. I see what you're saying. So one that's like more upright versus one that has kind of more of a horizontal back? Yeah. Cool. Great question, Rob. Thank you for asking. Oh, I mean, I'm going to ask you, Rob. What do you think? Um. Because you've obviously I, seen them both and you got the T-Rex shirt or the Jurassic Park shirt. Yeah. Um. I originally thought this would be more accurate, okay. but then I heard about the um, 
I think it was the iguanodon thing where there was big mistakes in the fossilization, so that made me think this one again. Mm-hmm. So I think this one more I think I think you're probably right. So, Rob, that's a really cool point. Um, the, the thing you mentioned with the iguanodon, when we first found iguanodon fossils, I mean, we now know they had thumb spikes, which is real cool because they're opposable. They're basically opposable thumbs. So it's not just humans and higher level primates that have opposable thumbs. Some dinosaurs did as well. But we thought that thumb spike was actually a nose spike originally when we found it. So the first interpretations of iguanodon, it looked much more like that dead iguana I showed you earlier with a weird thumb spike or nose spike thingy. We now know they're thumb spikes. Um, as far as T-Rex goes, you know what? At this point, we know that their backs were much more horizontal. That tail was used as a counterbalance. They weren't standing upright like Godzilla walking around. We know that for a few different reasons. Uh, well, in general, we know that dinosaurs aren't dragging their tails because we found lots and lots of fossil footprints and trackways without like a tail mark right down the middle between the legs or between the feet. So you know these things weren't dragging their tails. So that's a much more, I like it. It's a much more athletic, I would imagine, realistic stance for a T-Rex. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, I see another hand up. Uh, Taishi, I am about to unmute you. Yeah, I see you. Here you go. Go ahead. Cool. I have a question. Um, yeah. What about uh, prehistoric lizards that, lizards that lived before dinosaur times like Demetrodon? What, what about them? You're right. There were things that lived before dinosaurs like Demetrodon. Like about 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 like the question about um 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 flora and fauna um how did are are they kind of like how dinosaurs formed when they became fossilized or are they different? So great question. So the way that I described how something fossilizes, like an animal's body, that applies to any. It doesn't matter if it's a dinosaur, a marine reptile, a mammal. That same permineralization or I'm sorry, permineralization or replacement happens in fossilization regardless of the type of animal. I love that you brought up Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon lived way before the dinosaurs, was not a dinosaur. And in fact, we are more closely related to Dimetrodon than Dimetrodon is to dinosaurs. Um, the, and I learned this re for a number of reasons, different features. The coolest to me is, so Dimetrodon was one of the first animals whose maxilla or like basically the, root, the top of your jaw, not the bottom of your jaw, the top of your jaw was fused together and when that happens, it allows an animal to suck, like to suck on things. And that was a predecessor to mammals who suckle and breastfeed, right? And so that's one of the reasons why Dimetrodon is more closely related to us than it is to dinosaurs. So anytime you see a depiction of Dimetrodon with dinosaurs, that is not remotely accurate. Great question. I love Dimetrodon, though. Christina, I think let's do, it's 1240. I'm down yeah. for two more questions. Keep dropping, you guys keep dropping your extinction questions in the chat box. I'm gonna use those. We'll talk about extinction tomorrow. Okay, Nick, you're up. All right, go ahead, Nick. Um, so I have a stegosaurus on my head. So um, did the stegosaurus use the plates on its back for any defense? I'm trying to find you, Nick, in the pictures to see the stegosaurus on your head but I cannot, that's okay. So your question was, did Stegosaurus use the plates on its back for any type of defense? Uh, maybe, <laughs> honestly, maybe. So the thing with the Stegosaurus plates is, so those are, they're not actually fused to the spine, they're actually just embedded in the skin. So there's a possibility that they, they weren't always just sticking straight up. They could have like kind of moved a little bit. We also know that they were crisscrossed with channels of blood vessels allowing them possibly to like blush red and change color. Um, and so because of that, there's a few different ideas and hypotheses as to what they were used for. So one, thermoregulation, warming up or cooling down. Um, two, maybe scaring, trying to scare away predators. Let's say a predator is trying to eat it. And you know how a cat, when it gets scared, puffs itself up, makes itself look bigger. Maybe it did that, puff those up. Or those could have been a way to try to like win over a date the way a peacock has beautiful feathers to try to win a lady to make more peacocks with, uh, that could have happened with Stegosaurus. That might have been a display feature to try to win over new mates. So we're not really sure. Um, and that is gonna be a theme we come back to a lot with respect to weird features on dinosaurs. Uh, pretty much any weird feature is for fighting or for flirting. Sometimes both. Fighting or flirting though. That's, that's usually the go-to. Great question. All right, Christina, let's do one more. Okay, I have one from 
Uh, it looks like an email address, sdemers2. Uh, I see that you've been raising your hand, so here you go, you're up. Love it. Um, are light marks and Sue's skull from another T-Rex? Are the bite marks in the, sorry, I missed the beginning. In, oh, in, uh -oh. <laughs> in Sue's, Sue's skull, are, are they bite marks from another T-Rex in Sue's skull? Yes. They are. Yeah, because we can match up the T-Rex. Oh, this is Maya, by the way. She does not want to be held right now. That's Maya. She's one of the uh, bingo squares. Yeah, so the way they figure that out is you can actually take T-Rex teeth and match up the bite marks, whether it's on another T-Rex, on a Triceratops. doesn't matter the animal, and that's one way you can figure that out. Really cool. cool. Thanks. Yeah. Christina, do you have any last questions, thoughts, comments? What did I mess up? <laughs> um, me accountable. I, I don't think you messed anything up. Um, I'm sure I messed something up, but go ahead. Well, I mean, I have some notes, but we can talk about those after. But uh, <laughs> but I see that a lot of people still have a handful of questions. Uh, some of them are extinction related, and some of them are um, evolution and adaptation related, which go together. So mm -hmm. um, if you are feeling like your question was left out, tomorrow is a new day. Um, I did my best to get to everybody. Um, so. Yeah, thank you Wait, all for your curiosity. Actually, I'm because that's my favorite thing to nerd out about is about evolution and adaptation. Um, can you give me a sense of what those questions were about? Again, we'll do the extinction ones tomorrow. Same bat channel, same bat yeah. channel. Yeah, um, and on that note, I love a mass extinction. So ask me about how lots of stuff dies at once. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> but Tomorrow's your day. <laughs> uh, but the evolution questions are pretty broad, like how did dinosaurs evolve, mm -hmm. how did dinosaurs evolve, uh, how did they get their adaptations, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's like a general, like, how does evolution work question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, this is a good place to leave it. So generally speaking, uh, natural selection, evolution, works in the sense that different animals in every population have different features. Right, and certain features will allow certain individuals to survive longer, get more food, and make more babies that have those similar types of features. Right, so for instance, if you are, I guess we're gonna use polar bears for an example. If you're a polar bear or a species of bear that's very close to a polar bear and you're not all white, you probably don't have as much camouflage. It's probably harder for you to get food in the Arctic. You're gonna have less food. You're gonna be able to survive longer, have less kids. Right? And so those genes of having like the, the tan or darker fur are going to be passed on less frequently versus a polar bear that's all white is great camouflage is to be able to catch more food, live longer, have more babies. And so they pass that light fur uh, genes onto its offspring. And then over time, you can imagine those with those white fur that help in camouflage are going to be able to be more successful. And they're simply going to be more of them versus the other ones, which may actually die out. And that's generally how evolution works. There are environmental pressures on every individual and certain individuals will be able to survive because of certain features. And over long periods of time, nature continues to select for the features that allow the animal to survive and have more kids. So over time, you start seeing features that, that let certain animals survive really well in specific environments, right? You can't drop a polar bear in the middle of like Mississippi. It's not going to do very well. It's got too much uh, fur to stay warm and the colors aren't going to be good. So every animal is as well as possible adapted to its environment. And so over time, certain animals get better adapted to certain little niches, certain types of environments. And that's probably why, for instance, some long neck dinosaurs ate food from like small trees or on the grass versus other long neck dinosaurs probably reached up real high and ate leaves from the top of trees because their different adaptations and different features allow them to exploit and use different environments. And those that do that better have more offspring, they pass on those genes, and the process continues over and over. That is natural selection. The environment is naturally selecting for traits that allow an animal to survive uh, better. Versus artificial or unnatural selection, and a great example of that is literally every dog you see on the planet, because every dog you see on the planet originated about 10 to 12,000 years ago from wolves. And we have slowly selectively bred dogs for certain features and traits that we choose, right? We choose which ones come together to mate because we choose ones that are friendlier or furrier or cuter. And we make sure those have babies. So we are, we are the environmental pressure on those dogs. We're choosing who gets to mate versus in nature, that's not quite how it works. 
I, I would nerd out about evolutionary biology all day because every single feature you see on yourself or any animal or plant, it is there because it's been crafted and honed for generations and generations, making it as best fit for its environment as possible, uh, including Christina, I think, oh, is it, no? Oh, I thought, hold it up. So I was just speaking about what you're, I hope, do it, no? Is it, come back, come back. There we go, who's this? This is Calvin. Hi, Calvin. We made you, Calvin, over the course of 10,000 years. All right, guys, tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, we're going to be here noon every single day. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about extinction, right? Make sure you tell your friends, your family, everyone to come and join us, both on Instagram Live, ideally in the Zoom room. We can nerd out even better together. Uh, but I want you guys to remember, whether you're looking for fossils, scooping ice cream, or simply planting a garden in your yard, never stop digging. Catch you guys tomorrow. Peace out. Thank you, Christina. Co-hosts are amazing. I love all of you guys. Have a great Sunday. Dinosaurs are the best ever. Woo!